Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Carr. I'm coordinator for um, the Coastal Marine EBM Tools Network, as well as editor of the Skimmer on Marine Ecosystems and Management. Both of these are part of OCTO, um, Open Communications for the Ocean. Um, and on with me today, we have Nick Weiner from OCTO um, helping with the webinar. And we're very pleased to have Dr. Annie Britt from the University of Florida Levin College of Law, who's going to be speaking to us about revolutionizing ocean data. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know. Um, so in a few minutes, I will turn it over to Annie uh, uh, for her presentation. Um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A with all of you guys. Um, there's two ways to ask questions. You can type your questions into the chat or into the Q&A panel. Um, either way, I'll see it. Um, in with the chat, uh, you have different options. You can make uh, your chat visible to all um, everybody present or just um, the panelists here, uh, myself, Nick, and Annie. Um, if you, and you're also able to send information to all the, all the people present. Uh, if you choose that option, we just ask that you keep it professional and on the topic. Um, if you're sharing information with, with all the, uh, with the panelists and the audience. Um, and we'll hold most of the questions. If there's any quick clarifying questions, I can uh, ask Annie during the presentation. Otherwise, we'll uh, just roll with it and save all the questions till the end. Okay, uh, thank you anyone, everyone. And, and thank you so much, Annie, for being here. I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you all for being here. I'm excited to see so many people are interested in thinking about how we revolutionize ocean data and how we really begin to use a revolution in ocean data to revolutionize ocean management and our understanding of ocean ecosystems. So today I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what I think a vision for ocean data looks like and what that can enable in terms of management and um, governance of ocean resources. And then I'll get into kind of some of the weeds about where we currently are with our ocean data ecosystem and what steps we need to take to get to the kind of sort of idealized vision that I lay out at the beginning. So I'll start by thinking a little bit about um, what the future of ocean management is. And I think as a scientific community, and I assume that most people here are people that think about ocean management in general and are kind of aware that there are many threats facing the ocean. So we'll take that kind of as a given, right? We have a lot of threats facing the ocean. And I think there's a general understanding now in the science and policy communities that we need to really rethink how ocean management is working to be able to actively mitigate these threats. So there's, a there's I think, increasing consensus right on what we need to do from a management lens to face the coming threats to the ocean community. And so I just want to go through a few of these um, to get us all in the same frame. So if we think about the future of ocean management and look through some of the recent literature, as well as policy discussions, conferences, all the conversations that many of us are part of, there's many buzzwords about what the future of ocean management looks like. So we have adaptive and dynamic management. This is obviously extremely important and really hinges on the use of near real-time data to actively change management re regimes in response to changing conditions into a dynamic ocean ecosystem. Um, we talk a lot about integrated ocean management where we're not just looking at one single sector of the ocean at a time, but really bringing together many different uses and many different ecosystems to understand how the ocean can be better managed with that integrated lens. Um, we talk a lot about ecosystem-based management, right? And so this is pretty clear. I think we all are um, aware of what EBM is, but so ecosystem-based management, again, like integrated management, you don't just look at a single species, but you look at how many species interact together. Um, Rights-based management is also something that's become increasingly important, um, thinking about how property rights and allocations in fisheries and other resource sectors can lead to better management. Um, there's increasing use of public-private partnerships to drive ocean innovations and management innovations. Some really interesting work happening um, on plastics in this arena in particular. Um, and then the last, I think the last piece that people in this world are increasingly realizing is that our ocean management needs to really be globally driven and globally accessible. And that is something that we get from engaging with a broader range of stakeholders and really making our management regimes 
um, accessible in different ways. So what, regardless of which of these ocean management innovations we individually or organizationally are the most tied to and the most excited about, my argument is that uh, innovations in data are needed to support these management innovations. So really, regardless of what you see as the future of ocean management, better data and better technology can enable these innovations, but it's not a given, right? So there's a huge opportunity for data to enable new types of management, but unless we really rethink how we are gathering, sharing, managing data, we will not be able to reach the potential that we can with these ocean management regimes. So I wanna give one quick example of kind of what data can enable in terms of management innovations. There's obviously many more examples out there and I'm happy to talk more about those in the Q&A. But so this is um, an example of a potentially dynamic management regime that's very much supported by near real-time data, right? So, um, and bycatch, so this is an example from fisheries in, in which uh, the Nature Conservancy developed this e-catch system where the goal is to reduce the bycatch of certain protected species. And so by gathering data using new technologies, namely smartphones, um, fishers are able to give that data directly to managers and generate near real-time results that allow changes in um, what areas are mapped as high risk and allow fishers to essentially avoid bycatch, high-risk bycatch areas um, with near real-time implications. And so there's a lot of different examples like this that are starting to come online where different ways of gathering data can yield really interesting um, potential for management innovations that react very quickly to dynamically changing ocean conditions. So this is, uh, there's a lot on this slide and I'm happy to have these slides be available later on so that people can look through these in more depth. But from dynamically managing fisheries bycatch to integrating different types of data sources into near real time management um, decision making, there's a lot of different ways in which data and the new technologies that are generating new types of data can um, basically enable different types of management innovations. And the potential is huge, but I think the barriers are also enormous to getting to this kind of idealized future in which we are using data very well to make um, accurate and efficient decisions at a governance level. So we are seeing rapid increases in data and this is um, data flows to the World Ocean Database. So worth noting that this slide is very scientifically oriented and doesn't include a lot of the broader data streams out there, but looking just at data flows to the World Ocean Database, we've seen a drastic explosion in the amount of data that's being collected in the past decade. This, dec this explosion though is not being matched by huge rethinks in how we manage the oceans or really even our understanding of the oceans. And this is because there's a huge disconnect between the data that's being collected and how that data is being used. So that's really what I want to dive into today is, is why we're at this place where we are seeing more data on the oceans than ever before, but that data isn't necessarily leading to new understanding or new ways of managing ocean ecosystems. So this is one kind of idealized version of the barriers that exist to our current um, to a kind of more idealized vision of what data sharing can look like in the ocean. So right now, our data landscape is heavily siloed. So there are certain data sets that are globally accessible and shared very well, but for the large part, much of our data remains um, inaccessible, kind of locked away in various different organizational hard drives in ways that are essentially in, not interoperable and locked away from being used, accessible, useful to the broader world. Um, and there's a, there's a few different reasons for that, right? So some of it is data is not in the right digital formats. 
some of it is digital, but it's um, not, doesn't have the right metadata associated with it. Some of it is just um, unclear or shared in the wrong spaces. So a lot of different reasons why we have an ecosystem right now that's heavily fragmented where data is often very difficult to find, where you have redundancy. So some people end up collecting the same data sets. Very, um, very siloed and very difficult to use many of the most exciting innovations that are coming in analytics like machine learning on these very disparate data sets. So the goal for this ocean data landscape and for moving forward with ocean data is really to move from this siloed kind of messy, not interoperable landscape to one where the majority of data, if not, if not all scientific or um, industry data, the majority of data is data that can be used, accessed um, by managers and other people that are interested in understanding the ocean ecosystem better. So how do we do that? Um, this is a, an example again from fisheries and I thought a good depiction of what our current system looks like and what a future system could look like. So it, in the fishery sector, right, this is, um, you can see in this diagram, we have data coming in from both commercial and recreational fishers. Often now, that data coming in is in paper formats. This is obviously um, not true everywhere. There are many advances in electronic catch documentation, but a mix of paper logs and electronic logs, often mailed back and forth to managers. You have manual data entry, and then um, that digitizes the data eventually, but then those data go to usually managers who use it to eventually make decisions. But it's a very long process. It's often very convoluted. And um, the results that come out of it are far from real time, which leads to significant lags and inefficiencies in management when you have these time lags between when the data is collected and when it's actually being analyzed and becomes useful for decision making. Interestingly, this, um, this model also importantly you have electronic data that's really only shared with managers. And this becomes um, very problematic in industries like fishing where uh, the fishers themselves may have actually a lot of interest in having that data or having access to that data for various different purposes. So um, in, this, in this current model, even those who are often collecting the data don't end up having access to it or any way to really use it um, in a meaningful way. So if we think about how we move from this current system to a better one, there's many different suggestions. Um, and this in the, in the fisheries space, there's a lot of different tools that we're now thinking about using for um, collecting data itself from the get-go on vessels, from electronic monitoring with video cameras to various types of smartphone apps that can allow fishers to directly send data to managers. But all of these systems importantly are not paper <laughs> and automated, which allows for a much more um, speedy integration with existing um, data storage systems. So in, a, in this better world, these data storage systems are usually on the cloud, some way that um, uh, data can easily be uploaded by those collecting it and then accessed in near real time by managers. And so this then leads to decisions that can be made in days or weeks <laughs> instead of years, which is not maybe still as fast as we might like, but a very solid step in the right direction in terms of looking at, um, looking at how these decisions are made. So I think this, is a, this gives a kind of broad overview of what that data process can look like and how we can change it. But I specifically want to think about three major ways in which ocean data could be revolutionized and which I think it should be revolutionized. And I think if we focus on thinking about these three areas, it will lead to a lot of the um, changes that we need to see to support future innovations in management. So the first one, uh, uh, sticking to the kind of classic questions here, right? So. Um, I think the first thing I want to think about and to really push on is our understanding as a community of what is ocean data. So right now, 
the majority, I think, of what we think of as ocean data is pretty high quality scientific data. So data that's coming from established government observing programs, from scientific projects, from um, tagging marine mammals, a kind of classic array of ocean data sources. I think there's a number of, um, there's a lot of good work happening to think about broadening our understanding of ocean data beyond just this traditional scientific lens. Um, and there's, so there's many other interesting data sources that are becoming more and more important now in particular as more people have access to data gathering technologies and more access to ways of sharing and understanding that data in the future. So um, there's just a few examples here. One that, and <clears throat> One that I like to push on in particular is the idea of low quality data is one that is often very uncomfortable, I think, to the scientific community when they think about beginning to share and access and manage data better, is how do we that are not necessarily of the highest quality in these larger databases. So coming from the legal perspective, I think a lot about how, how good does data actually have to be to be used as the basis for any types of regulatory, legal enforcement decisions? And the key question here is understanding from the beginning, from when data is gathered and storing information about how data is gathered in metadata so that you can directly link data of different quality to the right uses for that data. So there's really interesting ways in which we can begin to use lower quality data for triage, for instance, for identifying potential problems that can then be researched further with more um, intensive methods and higher quality data outputs. But right now, this type of data and many of these others, citizen science, industry data, quality of data, they're not really being thought about when we think about a broader ocean data revolution. So. One thing that I think is super important as we go forward in thinking about what an ocean data future can look like is moving beyond just the very traditional data sources from our ocean observing systems to include all of these myriad other, other um, types of data. <clears throat> so then um, if, that, if that's the what and expanding what we think of as ocean data, then I think the next really big question is, is how. So how do we store access, use, understand data as part of our decision making process? And there's a few different examples, I think, of ways that we can begin to really push and really rethink how our current data systems work from relatively siloed uh, systems to ones that are much more global and accessible by many different parties. So the basis of all of this is standardized data tagging and metadata, which is not a new concept at all, right? I'm sure many of you who are interested in ocean data in general are very familiar with efforts to standardize metadata on a scientific um, perspective, at least. So there's a lot of good work. This um, diagram is from the Ocean Best Practices, which has done a huge amount of work to think about um, both tagging and kind of metadata in general. There's many other examples out there, but so this is not new, but it's entirely necessary as the basis for beginning to create global shared data systems. And so once you have a kind of baseline of metadata where people have agreed to um, tag their data with similar concepts, you can do a lot of really interesting things. And I would like to also note here that when, when we talk about data tagging, we talk about it, I think, a little more broadly than it's often thought about in the scientific community. And thinking about data tagging and metadata is not including just the traditional um, types of information like where, how maybe a piece of data is collected, but also what rights that data ha has attached to it. So the person who's collecting it or other people in the data system will have some say over what and how that data is used. And so including tags that, for instance, specify that certain data can only be used for non-commercial purposes or for research purposes is something that 
um, is essential for supporting future systems. So data tagging is a, a little bit broader here maybe than um, is understood in other contexts and creates opportunities to really think about how from, from the beginning, from when data is collected, you can build in a lot of context about how it can be used in the future. So once you have um, standardized tagging and metadata protocols, you can move and create federated data networks, which is something so um, that we have been thinking a lot about. And it's also not a new concept, but it's one that's being increasingly importantly used in other fields and deserves thought, thought in the ocean space. So this um, federated networks in particular have been very heavily utilized in the medical industry where <clears throat> there are very large privacy issues, right? So many regulations such as HIPAA preventing um, personal information from being shared. So to get insights that use, um, that use data and that use data from different patients the health industry has had to be quite creative in how they structure and share data. So federated networks essentially allow very private data to be um, shared globally with an intermediate step that preserves the privacy of that. So you can link together, and this is the federation, you can link and network together many different data sources and allow queries to be run from a global federated server that then draw insights from all of these many different nodes of the network without releasing any of the private individual data that those insights are based on. So this is something that is easily applicable to the oceans world. And um, there's, I think a divide right now, if you think about oceans data, there's certainly a strong community who believe that data, ocean data should all be open and accessible and we should liberate all the ocean data. And there's certainly a strong argument for that. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but understanding that right now there's a significant portion of the ind industry community as well as the scientific community that are unwilling to share um, all of their data in an open access format. Federated networks can really allow us to begin to link together different data sets while still maintaining some elements of privacy and confidentiality that certain data providers really do want. So a lot of interesting opportunities for Federation. Federation also importantly does not require creating an entirely new data system necessarily. You do have to build, um, build an architecture that will allow you to link together different pieces of this system, but it's a lower lift than some of the other um, more ambitious plans to link together uh, our ocean data sources. So we also, as part of a federated ocean data network, um, think that data lakes present a very interesting opportunity. And so data lakes are usually cloud-based, often run by Amazon or, or um, others, but so Amazon Web Services, for instance, will host a data lake that is, instead of being a very structured database that many of us are used to working with, data lakes are um, contain completely unstructured raw data and allow analytics to be run in the data lake itself. And so data can be accessed and used kind of as it's needed and then output into um, different types of analysis. So this uh, data lakes can be included essentially as nodes in a larger federated network. And this is something I think that's particularly exciting for, uh, for scientific data where there are fewer privacy concerns and potentially very interesting insights being generated from different types of raw data being combined together. Data lakes, uh, interestingly, have been really important in the past few months. I'm sure we're all sick of talking about COVID, but in, in the COVID context, data lakes uh, have been very helpful in terms of generating 
insights into COVID caseloads um, and, and many other pieces of the COVID puzzle. So Amazon has made their COVID data lake accessible to the public, and it's been very important um, for, for many different pieces of the research puzzle, which also is, is interesting both in the, I think, potential for data lakes to yield an important scientific function in the future, but also interesting just from a time perspective, I think in the oceans community, we're, we're used to working with data projects that take a very, very long time. So seeing that um, the health community was able to create these data solutions in a time period less than, you know, less than a couple months in many cases, um, just goes to show what is possible with the right amount of money and interest behind um, different options. So the combination of federated networks and data lakes that are all supported by kind of standardized tagging protocols really, I think, present new opportunities for thinking about how we can begin to manage and access ocean data um, in ways that capitalize on the amount of ocean data and allow us to generate insights, not just from the one data set that we collected ourselves, but from, from many different data sets. And so these, I think, there's a lot, there's a lot of opportunities out there for, for rethinking these architectures. And um, a, big, a big piece of that puzzle also is rethinking who, um, who is part of this ocean data ecosystem and how do we build these architectures going forward. And so there's, there's a lot of obviously um, different pieces of the ocean data puzzle. Uh, this is a diagram from the Decade of Ocean Science, which is very busy, so I apologize, but I think it gets well at the, both the number of different stakeholders that are involved in, in the ocean data questions, but also the different sources of um, science and knowledge that we're seeing and how that connects to a bunch of the broader pieces of the puzzle. So just as I think there is a tendency, particularly as we think about revolutionizing oceans data, the, there's a tendency to focus on high quality scientific data that I want to push back on. And just as there's that tendency, there's also, I think, a tendency to focus on scientists and managers as the kind of most important pieces of of this ocean data puzzle where scientists are generating the data and managers are the ones that eventually will be using it. Obviously, um, there are many other players in the ecosystem and one that we think is pretty underemphasized is industry. And so obviously the, there are many industry players in the ocean space who have been collecting huge volumes of data for decades um, that have potentially very important insights into ocean conditions, but these players are often very unwilling to share to share this data, right? And so thinking about ways and architectures that will incentivize this sharing is something that's kind of crucial going forward. And so federated networks are particularly exciting for engaging industry players in the sense that you can combine industry data with other types of data while still allowing industry to keep their data relatively closely held and control to some extent how it is used in the future. Um, likewise, I mean, there's a, a lot of increasing role for citizen scientists and other types of stakeholders in engaging in the scientific process. And so that's um, equally a, a big piece of this ocean data landscape going forward. So I think these three, these answering these three questions is really essential to understanding what a future for ocean data can and should look like. So pushing, pushing beyond what we think of as ocean data from just scientific, high quality scientific data to a much broader understanding of ocean data as um, different, different sources and different types of data that may be much more difficult to manage, but there are architectures and ways that we can begin to do that. And I think data lakes in particular present a huge opportunity for um, different types of data from qualitative data to traditional knowledge to low quality data to be included in data systems and to be the basis for really important management innovations. So um, this, a lot of the thinking in this talk <laughs> and um, much of the conclusions 
that we come to are part of a blue paper that was written by myself and many others as part of the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. So I'm gonna highlight some of the recommendations that came out of that blue paper, but if any of you are interested, there's, there's many more kind of specific next steps that we point to that are listed in that blue paper. So I apologize for the textually heavy slide here, but um, so it, for, in terms of getting from where we are and overcoming the key kind of barriers that we see to the current ocean data landscape, getting from this to an idealized future for ocean data where ocean data can in near real time drive uh, accurate, efficient decision-making on ocean resources. One of the first things that we kind of point to as a key piece of that puzzle is the need to really liberate ocean data. And by that, I think we mean push a cultural shift in how we uh, understand data and really move from the default that we currently have to a new one, which is that ocean data should be essentially open access, broadly available to other users unless there's some compelling reasons for it not to be. And if there are compelling reasons for it not to be, then we can use federated networks or other ways to protect that data while still giving insight and access to that data in the future. We think that government has a really important role in this. Um, and this can be, be um, in many different ways, but it's, this the move to liberate ocean data is not going to happen just in the scientific community just by scientists committing to open their data and make it open access it really needs to be a commitment that is backed by governments and that industry also engages in so we point to different actions that all of these communities really need to take to move towards um, a liberated ocean data future and so the second piece is i think we're in a really interesting um time period right now with the UN Decade of Ocean Science ramping up and many resources, both monetarily and intellectually, going into thinking about how um, we can move ocean science forward and how we can really um, use that ocean science to push sustainable development. So it's a, it's a prime opportunity to rethink how we use ocean data and to garner kind of um, widespread support and commitment to some of these goals as part of the broader UN Decade of Ocean Science process. And so um, we think that a really important piece of the Decade of Ocean Science will be pushing for many of these data innovations and beginning the process of reaching standardization going forward. So there's, I think this may be, yeah. So th this was the end of um, what I included for recommendations here. There's many more that we kind of got into in our blue paper and I'm happy to answer further questions about what next steps can look like and how we move towards a future of um, ocean data that is that enables the management innovations that we really need to better tackle um, the challenges facing our Ocean, ocean resources going forward. So I'll, I'll end there and look forward to questions to dive into any of these pieces in further detail. Okay, Annie, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Um, okay, uh, did you have any additional slides or anything? No, that's it. Okay, great, okay. Um, and I just wanted to let everyone know you can go ahead and send in questions through the chat or the question and answer uh, feature. So yeah, we, we definitely have questions and we'll go ahead and dive in. Um, question, is there anyone um, else suggesting that we build instrumented ecosystems where the data feed a model of the ecosystem for managers of the ecosystem to make weekly decisions um, and then the person who asked proposed there was a proposal of that nature. Um, but you know of anything like this? Annie? Yeah, sorry, I oh, just sorry. lost okay. you for a minute. I'm back. Okay, yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Were you able to hear the question? No, I was not. Could you repeat okay. it? 
Yep. Okay. It says, uh, is anyone else suggesting that we build instrumented ecosystems where the data feed a model of the ecosystem for managers of, of this particular ecosystem to make weekly decisions? Um, and then they gave an example of a proposal that something that proposes this, but they're curious if there's any examples of it. Um, there's, I think, broadly examples of similar ideas. I don't know if there's any that are directly what you're speaking about on a weekly basis, but there's, I think, um, a number of examples. The fisheries ones are the ones that come first to mind for me, but I that's sim simply because that's what I the field I've been working in most. And so there, there are uh, a number of examples, interesting ones where uh, bycatch in particular is, is a um, product where models from the data are going into near real-time management adaptations on a, you know, on a actually much more frequent than weekly basis. Um, and I'm sure there are more <laughs> that I am not as familiar with, but welcome anyone who has ideas or examples of those to put them in the chat as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Annie. Um, there's a question, how would you recommend reaching a global consensus on formatting data and me metadata? Are there tools such as best practices, templates, et cetera, that can support this? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a lot of good work that's being done on this already. And so I think what needs to happen now, so there are communities like Ocean's Best Practices and many other um, other pieces of the scientific community that have been thinking for you know near decades in some cases about how we standardize metadata. So at this point, it's um, less I think of a of a technical problem where we need to come to agreement and more of an adoption problem where people need to start using these and people need to start agreeing of the many different um, metadata protocols that we have out there, which ones we're actually going to use. And so I think. Um, that's that's really the interesting factor going forward and this is one of the reasons why we think the ocean the decade of ocean science can be particularly powerful is that if if it can really drive adoption of some of these metadata protocols that would go a huge huge distance towards beginning to reach this standardized adoption so a lot of a lot of metadata protocols have already been agreed on there's been a lot of consensus around what these should look like um, so I don't think there's any need to reinvent the wheel there. There's really just a need to drive adoption um, of these of these pieces going forward. Okay, thank you, Annie. Okay, another question. Are there federated networks currently implemented in fisheries? If not, what resources would you recommend us to consult other than the blue paper? Uh, so federated networks, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of anything quite like a federated network in fisheries, though there are some examples um, that are quite similar to them. If we think about how data is shared and managed in some of the regional fisheries management organizations in particular um, for port state measures, agreement implementation or other ways, there's some interesting, um, interesting regional cooperatives that have a lot of similar characteristics towards federated networks. So I wouldn't quite go so far as to call them federated networks. So I, I can't think of any true examples in fisheries that are 100% um, what we're thinking about here in terms of a federated network. And in, in thinking about resources for what federated networks look like going forward, the best examples are still in the healthcare space. So our blue paper has, um, I think some interesting examples from other fields like the healthcare uh, examples. And those are one of the best places to start. Though certainly there are smaller examples um, in the ocean space as well in, in different countries um, and in different collaborations, though I'm not aware of any fisheries specific ones. Okay, all right, thank you, Annie. Um, we have lots of questions now, which is great. Um, let's see. You mentioned there could be ways for industry to share data, but still maintain some control over it. Is there an example of this that has already played out? If not, could you describe an example you could see playing out? Yeah, so I, I'm not aware of an ocean example where this has already played out, um, but there are plenty of examples in other spheres as well. And so um, similar to kind of healthcare data being shared and maintaining its privacy through a federated network, industry data likewise 
uh, if you have the appropriate kind of tagging protocols in place, can be industry can determine how it's going to be used going forward. So there are certain mechanisms, and I think a lot about the financial industry actually when when we think about this, where certain types of data are allowed to be used for certain purposes. And actually, um, one example that a lot of people are familiar with is Creative Commons. And so that's something that is uh, very widely adopted on the internet, right? Where you have licensing that's been agreed on for images and videos and different tiers of licensing for different types of uses. And so there's certain um, pieces of the, uh, actually various industries that have adopted very similar kind of protocols to Creative Commons where you can uh, essentially tag or license your data with a certain allowable uses attached to it. And then going forward, that data can only be used by users that have um, essentially proven that they are in an acceptable category. So they are researchers and they're allowed to use this data for research, um, things, uh, things of that nature. And so in the ocean space, we think about, uh, there's a lot of different ocean industries that are collecting a lot of data, um, depending on what, <laughs> what type of information you're interested in. Some of the most interesting are aquaculture, oil and gas, also shipping, fisheries, all generating um, often very large volumes of data and potential for them to begin to share that data if they want to just with researchers, for instance, if you can create an architecture where these types of kind of Creative Commons-esque licensing tags are built into the metadata from the beginning. Oh, that's fascinating. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a question. I'd like to hear perspectives on how to improve access and integration of ocean data in the developing world, where ocean data is often a goal in a broader and growing blue economy development context, but where resources can be very limited. Yeah, that's a really great question and, and one um, piece of this puzzle that we've thought a lot about, as have, as have many others, and I think the answers remain quite difficult. So there's a, I think the potential for opening the access to ocean data more broadly and thinking about these kind of um, global systems is huge in terms of its ability to enable better understanding as well as management innovation and better um, blue economy outcomes in the developing world. So the potential for data is very, very high there, but there's a lot of capacity building that's needed both in the developed and the developing world to reach a point where data is accessible and usable in these places. And so um, there's no, I think there's no silver bullet, unfortunately, right? So this is a, a question of um, funding and getting funding for capacity building and also creating data systems that are usable not just by data engineers, but by managers themselves, both um, in, you know, in any location. And that's, I think, really one of the essential pieces that we, maybe I didn't touch on, on the, in this talk as much as I would have liked to, but when we talk about making data accessible, it's not just making it accessible to an algorithm that someone has to program on their computer, right? It's making it accessible in ways that are usable and understandable to, to anyone. And so the potential there is very high. And the, um, I mean, a lot of the data sets that we're talking about are relatively global. So once you start to think about integrating many of these data sets and putting them in formats that are usable, the, the value to the developing world that may have relatively less data about their um, ecosystems can be quite high. But there's a lot of work that's needed in this space. I mean, I think um, in general, there's a lot of work that's needed to um, support the movement from our current data system to one that's more integrated and more supportive of management outcomes globally. But the, um, the need to do it and the, the upside for it is potentially even higher in the developing world. So I don't, I don't have a silver bullet here. Our blue paper does get into this a little bit um, in different ways, but I think commitments to capacity building and to, to funding um, and to funding infrastructure from both private and public entities is really needed to enable that. Okay, great. Thank you, Annie. Now we have two 
people are both asking sort of similar questions. Um, and, and that's how can we incentivize research to sh researchers to share their data? Um, one, one person there working in the Western Indian Ocean, and, and they say much data is locked with individual researchers that may not be particularly willing to share their data. Um, can you address this? Um, what, what can incentivize people to share data with a broader community? Yeah, so this is a, a this is something we've I've thought a lot about, um, and I, I'm sure many of you have as well. And this is a huge problem, right? Is that the incentives to share for private researchers, for industries, for whoever are across the board quite low. And so, one thing that you can do is lower the barriers to sharing to make it easier to share your data. And, and when we think about um, federated networks and data lakes that's one of the pieces of that puzzle. So that makes it easier, right, to share your data, but it still doesn't necessarily incentivize you to share your data. So if we're talking about how we actually positively drive this change, there's a, a few different things I think that are beginning to push that envelope a little bit. And one is there's a lot of great work that's happening to begin to assign DOIs or other um, recognition essentially to data sets themselves so that researchers who are PhD students, for instance, who are collecting huge amounts of data that are then used very broadly can get recognition for that data set um, themselves in the same way that they might get recognition for publishing a paper. And so a lot, of, a lot of interesting work beginning to happen there that I think has the potential to at least push some scientists to share their data and change how we assign credit for scientific research, which right now, right, is usually based solely upon whether or not you're publishing a paper, not whether or not you're contributing data to a larger ecosystem that has a lot of benefit for many. So if we can begin to assign credit in different ways, that's certainly um, a helpful piece of the puzzle. I think there's also a lot of hesitation to share data because people are worried about their data being crit criticized. Um, and I think this is a changing that mindset and change, uh, also changing people's mindset about how valuable their data is or about people stealing their data is something that happens over time. And so I think we can expect that there, there already has been a, a cultural shift, I think, and there will continue to be one. So I think we can expect to see kind of a slow transition from scientists believing that their data needs to be held close um, to understanding that data sharing is probably not going to hurt them. And there are certain ways that we can push it from a regulatory level too, right? So in the UK, for instance, um, government funded marine projects are required to share their data uh, publicly, but they have a one to two year time period before they're required to share it to allow them to analyze it themselves and then publish it. But those types of government mandates obviously do a huge amount to, to overcome those barriers and incentivize sharing also. Okay, thank you, Annie. Um, there's so many good questions, so I'll get to as many as we can. Let's see. Um, one per, one, one um, participant said, quite enjoyed the talk, Annie, and can't wait to get a copy of the presentation. As we all know, when you mentioned, the amount of data has grown rapidly, has rapidly grown over the past decade. How can we more effectively let potential users of the data know about different data available? What can be the effective ways to disseminate the info? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think a, a pretty difficult one. So right now we have data catalogs and things like that, which are a pretty effective way, I think, or relatively effective, we'll say, at um, letting people know what data do exist. And so those types of data catalogs are, I think, a first step. And other types of, um, not necessarily data repositories, but indexes. That, so there's, I think, often they exist for specific subfields of science. And there's quite a few examples globally of those. And so that's, a, I think, a good way to start the process certainly of letting people know what data does exist. But I think um, they're only a drop in the bucket and what we really need to do is begin to integrate the data into larger data networks where you don't have to be letting people know that the data exists, that they just find it when they're searching for whatever related item, right? And so that's, I think, what we're really getting at with the, the federated data network concept is 
how do we lower the barriers to finding data and um, move move forward in that way? Okay, great. Um, a question, a big issue with many data sets is extremely variable data quality, which makes it difficult to know what purposes it is fit for. This is magnified when the data is used in a federation, and you may not be aware of what people are using it for. Are you aware of any techniques to flag, control, and or correct poor quality data sets before the errors propagate into decision making? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so, uh, and obviously if i'm arguing that we should be including lower quality data in these data systems it's something that we really need to figure out so i think part of this is is in the metadata um, and data tagging piece of the puzzle where it needs to be either made clear by those collecting the data what methods they used and any potential quality concerns that may derive from that or whoever is adding processing the data needs to also um, be able to add those flags as needed. And there's different ways of doing this. Um, you can either, depending on what ki kind of system it is, where you're either tagging data with explicit information about its quality and how it's collected, or you're tagging it with what it may be fit for use by. But um, one of the pieces of uh, we'll say an ideal <laughs> data data network is that those collecting the data ultimately have um, a lot of control over what data they put into the system and, and how they do tag that data, which can generate problems down the road. So having um, trusted parties, trusted brokers, intermediaries that are able to flag certain data sets as low quality is pretty essential to the process, but also it's not going to be the only answer to that question. And I think that's, it's an area that really um, we need to continue to think about how we identify that poor quality data. And right now is certainly, I think right now there are data sets where through word of mouth, we kind of find out that this data set has quality issues or um, one researcher discovers that a data set is not as high quality as they may have hoped and they stop using it, but that information does not disseminate in any meaningful way. And so others may then use the data set so having a centralized system where data quality can be reported and checked and any issues with it can be flagged by anyone using the data set and then reviewed later, I think is really important. But I don't, I think that there's a lot of further work that needs to be done on this. And I certainly don't have the final answer on what the best methods to do that would look like. Okay, thanks, Annie. Um, sort of branching out from that uh, question uh, came in. For me, one of the main challenges to realize this vision is the need for detailed in the weeds data wrangling. That work is often not exciting nor rewarded in academia, and there can be a lack of funding for data federation slash management efforts. Do you have any recommendations on capacity building efforts for the data science work that could support this vision? Yeah, this is, I mean, so true, right? Both, I think, I, to a little bit to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, where, where you don't get credit for all the data wrangling work that you're doing as an academic, usually, which is often hugely time consuming and, again, not very fun <laughs> generally to clean up a data set and make it ready to go into this or to build an extensive architecture that allows for data sharing between parties. Um, so I think some of this is a, is a mindset, set, mindset shift. There's certainly beginning to be a lot more excitement about data science um, in the broader world, maybe not necessarily so much in the ocean community yet, but I think it, there's potential for it to trickle down. We see a lot of um, people who are interested in data and data science and the power of data going into various technology firms. And I think um, likely that that will begin eventually to spill over at least to some extent into, um, into the ocean and environmental world more broadly. But, in the meantime, I think um, pushing again for ways in which we can expand how we give credit in academia to data work would be a really important piece of this puzzle so that there is an understanding that even if you spend a lot of time cleaning up, working on making a data set shareable, that that has some value that is um, an important piece of 
the role of an academic, the role of a scientist in the ocean world. Uh, but in general, I think a lot more funding needs to go into the data, um, data management, data infrastructure. There's different rules of thumb now about how much of you know a big grant should go towards data management. I think those, it would be great if we saw those rules of thumb, 10% of a grant, something like that, become much more mainstream and um, widely adopted where that 10 to 20% of a grant is actually used for data management. Um, and that requires commitments both from the scientific community as well as from the government to really mandate that we actually spend the time and the money to do this because yeah, it's not always fun but it absolutely needs to happen. Okay, thank you, Annie. Um, let's see, another question. Are there technologies you'd recommend such as app-based data collection tools to enable dig digital data collection and incentivize moving away from paper data? Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of apps being developed. <laughs> apps are the new cool thing I hear. So no, um, there's, I think in fisheries in particular, there's been, a lot of different examples from many different providers, depending on what you're interested in, from uh, things like MFish, which are kind of blockchain based and very um, oriented towards developing world countries to, to tools like eCatch or others that are being used in, um, in the US. So there's a lot of different examples, I think, depending on what your specific uh, desire is in terms of data collection and how that integrates with management. but the prevalence of smartphones has really opened the doors to how we can collect data and how we can collect data specifically on human uses. And there are a lot of different providers that have really taken advantage of that by building different apps. And there's, there's many out there. I'm happy to give more examples with more specific questions about what actually you're, you're interested in. Okay, thank you, Annie. All right, last question. Um, what would be your targeted recommendation to draw in data and researchers from and build capacity in developing countries? Yeah, um, there's, I, I think, again, I am probably not an expert on this specific piece. So take what I say with a grain of salt and then we should absolutely bring in others that are that are experts on this to give much better answers and to make sure that those opinions are really well integrated into future data systems. But I think um, you know there's a lot of great conversation happening right now from folks like Asha DeVos and others about how we can decolonialize science in these places. And I think the data pieces of this are very important as well. So making sure that um, funding for projects that are taking place in the developing world and the data that's gathered by those projects is accessible to, um, to the, that place is, is really essential. And part of that is making sure that we actually have researchers from that place on any expeditions or data gathering um, projects that happen there. But the data access, I mean, I think this is, and I talked about this, I think a little bit at the beginning was one of the biggest issues right now with our data systems is that data that's collected by fishers in, in certain places or scientific data that's collected in certain places largely goes to large management organizations directly. And, and the fishers that are interested in that data or the local people that are impacted by the ecosystem that the data was collected about specifically, they don't have access to it. And so I think a really essential piece for the developing world in particular is making sure that any data that's collected in their waters is ultimately accessible to the public of that place. And there's a lot of work to get there, I think, but um, also a huge amount of opportunity if we are really able to push on that going forward. Okay, Annie, this was wonderful and, and uh, great job answering the questions um, and I'm so sorry to everyone we weren't able to get to all the questions there was because there were a lot of really good questions remaining but uh, we will be able to provide those to Annie uh, after the webinar so again thank you to everyone who attended thank you Annie for for presenting and answering questions and uh, we wish you the best with this work and um, thank you everyone we hope to see you on future webinars okay. all right bye everyone